Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss the news, information, and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This is episode number 27. Today, we get a CEO's perspective on the digital transformation of healthcare. This podcast is brought to you by Health Lyrics. Are your strategies constrained by infrastructure, or are you tied in a knot of applications? We've been in your shoes. We've been moving health systems to the cloud since 2010. Find out how to leverage the cloud to new levels of efficiency and productivity. Visit healthlyrics.com to schedule your free consultation. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer and advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. Before I get to our guest, an update on our listener drive, we've exceeded 200 combined new subscribers between our YouTube and podcast outlets, which means we've raised $2,000 for Hope Builders, which provides disadvantaged youth, life skills and job training needed to achieve enduring personal and professional success. I've hired their graduates and their stories are really nothing short of, uh, of amazing. They're very inspiring. We have uh, six more weeks uh, where our sponsor has agreed to give $1,000 for every additional 100 subscribers. Join us by subscribing today and be a part of giving someone a second chance. Uh, today's guest is the president and CEO of Providence St. Joseph Health, a faith-based a faith-based, not-for-profit health and social services system with 111,000 caregivers in 50 hospitals, 829 clinics, and uh, someone I consider to be a digital health visionary. Today, Dr. Rod Hockman joins us. Good morning, Rod. Welcome to the show. You know, your, your bio is pretty awesome, but the show has a limited time frame. So if you don't mind, I'd like to condense it a little bit. Are, are you okay with that? Uh, so, lead, so you've had leadership positions at uh, Providence, Swedish, Centera in Virginia, Health Alliance of uh, Greater Cincinnati, and Guthrie in Pennsylvania. Uh, Rod has served as a clinical fellow in internal medicine at Harvard Medical School and Dartmouth Medical School. In addition, he is a fellow at the American College of Physicians and a fellow at the American College of Rheumatology. He received his bachelor degree for, and medical degrees from Boston University. Actually, my, my daughter is uh, interested in BU, and we're heading up there in the fall for a visit. Is there anything I should know about BU before I head up there? Absolutely. I was just there on campus. I was actually gave a talk at the medical school, and the campus is growing like crazy. And uh, you know, the big sell is, you know, it is at uh, Boston, you know, and it, the university's been great. So it's, uh, I, I, I felt, go for it. And any way I can help, let me know. Yeah, well, I, I, I am looking forward to uh, any time you get to visit Boston in the fall. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. So I'm looking forward to, we're going to visit some, I, I don't know, you know, your youngest daughter going to Boston, or she wants to look at schools in New York City and Philadelphia. I mean, these are big cities, and I live on the other coast. So it's, uh, anyway. You've, well, you've, I'll, I'll tell you, I know all three cities. I vote Boston, hands down. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> that's my vote. Well, I, uh, let's see. So uh, there's two other great sentences in your bio. So um, I'm going to touch on these. So uh, under Rod's leadership, Providence St. Joseph Health is transforming healthcare for the future through digital innovation, genomics, and scientific wellness, pop health, and outreach to the poor and vulnerable. In addition, mental health is a top priority for Providence St. Joseph Health, which is contributing $100 million to establish an independent foundation focused on improving the mental health and wellness of communities. Uh, so let's break that down a little bit. So digital innovation, genomics, scientific wellness, pop health, and outreach. Give us a high level on some of the things that you have going on right now at, at Providence St. Joseph Health in, in those areas. So, you know, we're, we're in the belief that, you know, the health system of the future is going to have to look different than it is today. And that there's certain areas that we felt we had to make a commitment to. And, you know, there are two areas that have been slow to get the digital revolution. That's been higher ed and uh, healthcare. And uh, whether we like it or not, it's, it's here. And what we did, I think the smartest thing we did about four years ago, we hired Aaron Martin from Amazon to be our uh, chief of di digital uh, informatics, of, uh, you know, to, to handle this for us. And as it was as much a cultural change as it was a technological change for us. And, you know, and Aaron has a great diagram that you put the technology people together with healthcare people, in the middle you get magic because they both need each other whether they recognize it or not and i think we recognized that four years ago that if you're going to take this digital revolution on you better put those folks together so we've come to the realization that you know digital is the way healthcare is going to go it's the only way we get the scale 
So we've been working in a whole bunch of areas which we can explore, but we consider that to be job one for the transformation of our system. The second area was, you know, we felt the largest health crisis in the United States. Now, if you look at folks, about 40% of patients that we see have some concomitant primary or secondary mental health disorder. And that if we don't get on top of this, and we're seeing this in the country, we look at the suicide rates, a lot of that's been out there. We look at the opioid epidemic. It's really, if this was Ebola or something else, we'd, we'd say, gosh, we have an epidemic, we've got to do something about it. So we felt as a health system, we had to put a stake in, in the ground. We've got to we put our money where our mouth is and say, we're going to put hundred million dollars create this new organization called the World Bank Trust so that other people could join us. So that this isn't just a Providence St. Joseph effort, this is really a national effort. And we've gotten folks from all around the country, including Patrick Kennedy, Maureen Bizzignano, to be part of our advisory board. So people could see this as creating solutions for mental health. The third is, you know, we have the, the other revolution that we have is the genomic revolution. We're, you know, we have this intersection between biologic science and computational science. And what that enables us to do is to explore new innovations in healthcare that we couldn't even dream of when I started med school 40 years ago. But it's all about computational ability to be able to do it. Lee Hood, who's our chief scientific officer, Lee is a Caltech PhD combined with a MD from Johns Hopkins. So, Lee is this intersection between computational science and biologic science, and has spent a good part of his career in sequencing the genome, but now his area of interest is, what is it in the genome that are clues to why people stay well? So we, he's termed the, the, the term scientific wellness. So it's the approach that if you can look at the genomic and biomic characteristics of folks and figure out what, what they have, Maybe we have the clues to making us all live into our 90s. And Lee's lab is in Southwest Union, right where Amazon is. He's really helped us transform our thinking about how we look at not just healthcare, but health in general, and how do we apply science to health and wellness. Uh, and then the last area is our Institute for Human Caring, which looks at how do we look at, as we enter the latter stages of our life, how do we do that in a way that we all would want as doctors, IT people, how would we want to pass through that? And you know, our approach is that you don't necessarily just need a, a bill that lets you have uh, assisted suicide. We think there's another pathway. And uh, uh, Ira Biox's work in this area is incredible. And uh, it's really a movement to, to, to let people know that as they reach the better parts of their lives, that there's an alternative to, to, to the way it's being done. So those are just some of the areas that we think are you know, critically important for the health system to be engaged in. And uh, we think that's where some of the future is. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's an awful lot. And it's uh, really exciting. I know that, um, you know, the sisters and you and Deborah were so excited about the, the mental health initiative. And um, it's really exciting to see, uh, I mean, not only Providence St. Joe's, but we're seeing this uh, really a couple organizations across the country start to really step up uh, in that area and maybe take the, uh, take the mantle of this is really an epidemic that needs to be uh, addressed head on. Um, so let's, let's jump into, you know, for those of our listeners, we usually do uh, in the news sound bites and um, we do uh, social media close. We're going to lose a social media close. We only have 45 minutes with, with Rod. So I'm going to spend more time on sound bites, a little bit on in the news. So, so Rod, here's what we usually do during this section. I, I toss out some questions, usually one to three minute answers. If you go longer than that, um, I'm not going to stop you. It's more of a guideline than a rule. Uh, and, from time to time, people throw questions back at me. I cannot guarantee answers, but uh, it happens. So, um, so here we go. Um, uh, first question: How does uh, how does the competitive landscape really change in healthcare with the emergence of digital technology? Right. So I, I think what digital helps us do is get to scale. I think the biggest problem that health systems have had is how do you get to scale? And how do we? For us, we take care of 13 million people a year. How, how do we make that 20 million? You cannot do that 
having people visit your office, coming in for a visit. You've got to use technology and you know, the digital tools are there. It's not digital versus hands-on, it's digital and hands-on. So we look at digital being able to really improve our skill and be able to get us out to places where we haven't been before, whether it's either through telehealth, it's through apps, uh, it's, it's through people having their own personal health records. So we think unless you have digital tools, you can't take care of people's health and you can't get the skill. Yeah, it's, but it's also going to bring in potentially uh, some new competitors. So as we look at the new competitor uh, and potentially partner landscape, uh, new things are emerging. So you have CVS, Aetna, uh, JPM, Chase, uh, uh, Amazon, Optum, DeVita, and, and various other uh, mergers uh, coming coming to bear. So um, let's take this from two perspectives. What what challenges are those leaders uh, with those new models going to face, given how how much of a physical plant is required for medicine at this point, and how are these these models going to change the traditional health system uh, like Providence St. Joe's? So there's words of caution all the way through. So if we use a Uber analogy, right? So Uber has been able to revolutionize mobility without owning a car, or plane, or train, or anything else, nor do they have any plans on doing that. So I think we in healthcare who feel so secure in our big buildings better watch out because you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blockbuster analogy. It's all of those ones that are out there. Uh, bricks and mortar, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable just sitting back there. So I think for, for the folks in healthcare, we've got to either, we have to partner, we have to develop, but we have to have a digital solution to what we do. So it's, it's the equivalent of saying, I'm just going to have my stores and sell my DVDs versus I'm not going to go out in, in the digital space. So I think that's a, that's a threat and an opportunity for healthcare. But it's not elective whether you go on to the digital side, you have to. And then for smaller organizations, depending on who you are, I think you've got to find the partners that are out there. Yeah, so, um, you know, as we look at, well, actually, let's, let's change gears a little bit here. So um, let's, let's take a look at the role of the consumer. So the consumer in, in today's marketplace is very different than the consumer in previous uh, years. And what we're seeing is a lot of health systems change their models. Um, I've had a CIO on the, on the show who was talking about how they're really taking apart the health system. And now they have, um, literally, they're taking the departments, they're breaking out the big campus, and you're seeing them on street corners and, and all over the, the city. They're making them more accessible. Um, how, how is the consumer really dictating uh, your next moves and your next steps uh, in terms of how you uh, make it more convenient, more accessible, uh, really focus in on, on experience and outcomes? So when we look at our, our new strategic plan, which we call Health 2.0, we put the consumer right in the middle. And we, we say, as a consumer, how do I want it? I want the healthcare where I want it, when I want it, how I want it. But sometimes it's at home, sometimes it's on my iPhone, sometimes it's in the office, sometimes it's in the hospital. But that's our whole focus. And I think that's one of the things that our Amazon folks have really helped us with that work for us, is they are completely consumer driven. And they're really teaching us how we have to do that. So we've shifted our focus completely in that direction to put the patient, the consumer at the center of everything we do. And that that is for all of our caregivers. As you said, you know, we take care of the poor and vulnerable. If you're a Medicaid mom in Washington State, or if you're a Microsoft executive, or if you're an executive in Southern California, we want to make sure we tailor our experience to you. So we're all in on the consumer side. We think everything has to be directed towards the individual. They want their personal records. They want to have that personal attention. And that's what we think so let's um, precision medicine. You mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Leroy um, Hurd, Hurd, Dr. Leroy Hurd, uh, your chief science officer. So precision medicine based on genomics holds great promise. We know that uh, this technology is really advancing pretty rapidly. Um, how does how does your health system prepare for what 
really could be a radical change in the way care is delivered and received in the future. So I think that's why we hired Leon, because we, we recognize we didn't have that expertise in our large health system. And we're also not an academic health system, but Lee is the one that's helping us shape what are the practical considerations of genome sequencing. But you know, what's interesting about Lee's work, it's not just about the genome. You know, and I, I need to say that. It's about the biome, it's about your laboratory data, your phenotypic data. But what, what, what today's world lets us do is put this big, dense data cloud together and figure out for Bill Russell, okay, what's, what's, what, what do you need to do next? And so we think we and his work uh, at Personalized Health really helps us put us in a position to know what we need to do. And, Sequencing continues to spiral into, it's almost, it's gonna be uh, available and, and ready for everyone. Uh, uh, you gotta just figure out how to use it effectively. Both if you're ill, but also if you're well. And I think we put our, we put our chips on the work that these do to help us navigate through that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you've done this yet, but I, I, I went down to uh, Human Longevity down in uh, San Diego and I, I did the full battery uh, genomic sequencing and, and uh, the, the rest of the services that they offered. It was fascinating to me um, just how, uh, how much more precise they can be and how much they could say, you know, a, a, if, you're, if your physician prescribes for you these medicines, you're going to want to direct them in, in this direction instead of this direction. It's amazing that when you treat them as, treat people as like just people as opposed to Bill Russell, the individual, uh, the diagnosis could change, and the 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 path, the treatment path, could could change pretty pretty uh, dramatically. Well, what we're finding with the work with the genome is that many medications that we prescribe, they work for you, but not for me. And how do we know that? Right now, it's trial and error. Well, well, I guess it's not working, you know. And what we're finding are there secrets in the genomic pattern that will help reveal whether which medicine works for you, which one works for me. Obviously, the most obvious thing that we've been talking a lot about is how we've been over-treating you know, women with breast cancer. And we kind of treated everyone the same, so everyone got the same cocktail of chemotherapy. But what you really find is that there are subsets amongst that group of women that for this group, this treatment makes sense, but for this group, it doesn't make sense. So, what it's helping us do is create a lot of specificity about tailoring both your treatment and what you should do according to who you are. And that work is just accelerating dramatically. My wife is in a program that uh, came out of this group called Aravale, similar to what she'd experienced in San Diego. And she's on the phone with, I think she's on the phone with her coach today, going through all of her data, her genomic data, her biomic data, figure out what you should be doing next. And that is, wow, that's a whole different world from where I was even 10 years ago uh, in healthcare. Yeah, I, I love the direction it's going. So, um, you know, one of the things we, we probably don't talk about enough on this, this show or in other contexts is just the cultural change that's required. So digital requires significant cultural change. Um, we saw a slow uptake in telehealth because it's, it's a new behavior. And even though now we're starting to see a significant rise in telehealth, it's taken many years uh, for that to happen. AI requires acceptance uh, within the health system as well. Uh, and there's many other examples. Um, how, does, how does a leader uh, lead cultural change that is, that is required to really accelerate the acceptance of these new technologies? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question because I think I think we're starting to see an explosion. It's, it's moving a lot faster than it was in the past. Uh, you know, Tom Friedman in his book talks a lot about this kind of explosion on the curve of how fast you have to be able to move. So what I've been impressed with is I, I've noticed that what, what took longer before is not taking it. But if you don't pay attention to the culture, you can really get burned. And uh, you know, you and I have both experienced that in our roles that if, if you're not thinking about how the doctors and nurses work, you just throw some technology at it or something else, it's sometimes, wow, you just hit up against the wall. So kind of getting people to understand and adapting to change, and I think just as important 
it's this whole science of change management. How do you get large groups of people to change their behaviors? And there's a lot of good work that's being done in that area. And then I hit, I think you hit that tipping point. You've hit that tipping point in telehealth for sure. I think we're starting to see some of that tipping point in genomics, starting to see that change. Uh, the acceptance of telehealth and being on the screen, you know, telepsychiatry, people want telepsychiatry because it's more than they want face to face with. They don't want to sit in the office somewhere. So I, I think, but, but, understanding what are the cultural issues. And then, you know, it's the same way we deal with a lot of diverse populations. There's also cultural sensitivities with different groups that we take care of, that their approach may be different than a group of executives that live in Redmond, Washington, uh, versus someone who's in, in LA or so, somewhere else. So it's being aware of that. And I think having some people on your team that really Yeah, we almost need to be uh, sociologists today to help people to uh, really see and and uh, understand the change that's that's that people are going through as we introduce technology. Um, so uh, beyond beyond the politics, because I don't want to end up in a, a rabbit trail here. Um, how important is healthcare policy in the in the delivery of uh, triple or quadruple A and cost quality patient and clinician experience uh, for healthcare? Well, you know, I, I'd say, again, without going down the rabbit trail, what, what I think, it's kind of like the markets. We like consistency. So just just tell us what the rules are, but keep them the same, you know? And I think whether it's IT technology or privacy or all the issues that the IT folks are dealing with or the, the healthcare delivery folks are dealing with or the markets are dealing with, what we really crave is consistency. Because then we're very adaptable. But the problem is when the rules change constantly, we're not quite sure where we are. And I think that's, if you put it down, that's probably the greatest frustration we've had. Uh, you know, now we're gonna see a whole spate of change in privacy laws. You know, we saw that in California. Yeah. And that's set off a whole sequence of different ways that we need to think about from a healthcare informatics standpoint, what do we do with that? Uh, you know, the rules are changing, whether it's on 340B drug pricing or something else. So I'd say the biggest challenge that we have with policy is inconsistency. And I wish sometimes policymakers really understood what we did. And what I feel, my comment on policymakers, policymakers sometimes stifle innovation. Uh, one of the great things about the United States is that we're great innovators. But you gotta get out of our way a little bit. Okay, tell me what I need to get to, but don't tell me how to do it. And that's what makes us great, I think, in this country. We've got some incredibly bright people that if you let them just be able to do it, we'll figure it out. But don't micromanage us with policy. I, I won't talk about lawyers and people in Washington, but you know, kind of what we need are set what you want the goals to be, but let us innovate in you know, the public-private partnerships that we can do. And I think we're starting to see that between different companies or technology companies, healthcare organizations working together. That's, that's where we're gonna make real progress. So consistency, we're looking for consistency in policy. Well, I think as long as we have a democracy, where that's, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna have inconsist inconsistency for a while. But you know, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, John Holomka was on, and we talked about this, and it was, he, he said almost the exact same thing. He said, you know, we, we started, Meaningful use started out in one direction, and then everyone took it as their policy lever, and they started adding to it. And specifically, the, the thing he said is, they started to tell everyone how. So this is how you have to do this, and how you have to do this. And quite frankly, how you do it in Washington might be different than how you do it in Lubbock, might be different than how you do it in Topeka, Kansas. So um, it becomes, becomes very hard for health systems to keep responding to that, at least, um, uh, and innovate and not drive costs through the through the roof. Uh, I did I did prior to this ask uh, uh, one of your peers for a question, and uh, he he wanted me to ask you about artificial intelligence. There, um, and there are so many different places that we can utilize AI. How how are you going to determine what area you're going to focus in on? So I guess it's really true of any emerging technology, but how do you prioritize your technology investments? Right. So I think, you know, because otherwise that's the biggest problem, I think, for healthcare systems that you can get lost. 
So every day, Bill, when you and I go to one of these conferences, there's 150 new companies that probably won't be there next year. The question is, how do you figure that out? So our approach to that has been to create the fund by which we evaluate emerging companies that we think have value to us. So we like to be investors and users at the same time. So I think that's a, that's a good way to kind of sort through that morass. And you know, we put people in charge of just looking through technology uh, and sorting through it. Because you know, one thing I know as a CTO, you shouldn't be trying to figure that out, get someone that actually knows what they're doing. In the whole area, and I, I, I always divide it up, there's the different digital technologies that are out there. Then there's the whole area of data. And how do we approach that? And then particularly, how do we approach AI? And that's where, you know, we, our new CFO came to us from um, Microsoft and uh, is also an expert in AI. So I, I think I have the first CFO that's a CFO and an expert in AI at the same time. But we've been spending a lot of time, you know, particularly with him and with uh, uh, Microsoft about kind of sorting through that. I had the opportunity to be at, uh, I've had the opportunity to, to uh, be with the folks at Microsoft and they talk a lot about AI, how to apply it. And then also what are the ethics that are involved in how you use AI? So with that, I, I'm looking at a partner. It looks like you know we're learning a lot from the folks at Microsoft about how we do that. So I see that before we just dive in, we sort it out with some good technology partners and look at it from a standpoint of what are our problems we're trying to solve and then what are the best solutions. So we've taken a very, uh, uh, I would say, systematic approach to that, but recognizing that we're going to probably need some help in the other front. Yeah, and I, you're... Um... So one of the things you did is you, you split out innovation from IT. I mean, you haven't split innovation out. Innovation is across the entire organization. Clinical, is, it's, it's just innovation is innovation. But you do have a, a, a group uh, led by Aaron Martin, and you have your IT that's separate. And we've seen a lot of these models and even some newer emerging models where you have a chief transformation officer is now sort of a thing that's out there. Um, I guess the, the question is, do you do that because of this thing, because there's so many emerging technologies and so many partners to evaluate and so many, um, and, and you want to sort of introduce new ideas to the organization? And is this, is this really something that's a, uh, a, any health system of any size, or is this because of your scale that you've split these things out? I think it's some both. I, I think it's a, just a great principle. I think what's happened in the past when we've tried to be digital and be innovation, it's got crushed out by the rest of the organization. And we've seen other models in other industries where the core business just crushes out the new ideas. We've said, we got to separate it, we've got to fund it, and it needs the direct support of the CEO. And I think those are key words. The CEO has to believe in it, it has to be funded, and it can't be allowed to be subservient to the tradition mainline core business, which for us is our hospitals, our clinics, and everything else that are out there. So I think that's really important. I think every organization can do it. I think if you're a smaller organization, that's where you've got to look at who's your partner, who how else can you do this? Because you can't maybe hire someone like Aaron, but maybe you can get together with some other partners to be able to do that. So I, I think it's not, you don't get off the hook just because you're smaller. You just have to figure out a different way to do it. And some of that is through partnerships, coalitions, and elsewhere to be able to do it. We've had a lot of smaller places be our partners, uh, you know, both on technology, on IT. We can do it on their own, but hey, we can partner with Providence and Joseph. To do that. So I think that's the model for the future, but I don't think anyone gets off the hook on having to make sure that they have the innovation to do that part of their organization that's growing and able to innovate. Yeah, I was, um, I was asked on a panel uh, who, who I thought led the uh, digital initiatives at a, at a health system, and uh, my answer was the CEO, and no exceptions. I think the CEO has to be the leader because digital strategy is strategy today. There's, there's really no separating that. Um, 
All right, well, let's let's move to the news. So perhaps this is old news to some, uh, the non-merger with Ascension. Uh, the merger would have created something in, in in the, the, the scope of 200 plus hospitals, 30 some odd states, the, the scale's really breathtaking. Uh, in, in the end, you said the timing wasn't right. Uh, I guess there's two questions. The first being uh, the obvious one, uh, tell us about the decision. And then the second uh, question being, uh, do you think we're gonna continue to see uh, more mergers in healthcare, uh, traditional and non-traditional? And, and just elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. First of all, I think you know, Ascension's a great organization, and Tony Tristini and I are very, very close there, CEO, and um, you know, we went right down to the wire. Uh, I think what we both stepped back on was that we both had a lot of initiatives, both at Ascension and Providence, that needed to be taken care of. And you know, all of merge, mergers are about timing. And we both felt that we needed to take a pause and kind of think about what both organizations are doing. We had a lot on our plate. You know, our, our agenda at Providence and Joseph, Tony had a similar agenda, and we just felt timing wasn't just right, that it would almost be too much of a distraction for both of our organizations. So we both decided, you know, we liked everything we saw. We still think the fundamentals were 100% correct about creating scale, but also because the writing organizations need to function the way they are but that the timing wasn't right and that they now we put it on hold. Uh, but I, I think we're gonna continue to see, we're seeing Advocate and Aurora come together, uh, in the US, uh, CHI Dignity, you know, we saw Bon Secours and Mercy and Cincinnati. I think we're gonna continue to see that because organizations need to get to scale, but they also need to, to lower their operating costs. And there are good mergers for the right reasons and the mergers for not maybe the right reasons. But if they're done the right way, they are going to be incredibly helpful as we go forward. So I think we're going to continue to see this. Uh, I think the, uh, the provider sector is going to be under a lot of stress next year. I think we're going to continue to see stress on reimbursement. And I think organizations are going to come together and try to figure out how to do this better. The second alternative, though, to uh, Call on mergers, which are, you know, sometimes regulatory nightmares and all the things that are inherent, are now creating coalitions around certain things that we need to do, whether it's around data. And recently, you know, we're part of the initiative of generic uh, drug manufacturing uh, with Microsoft, uh, with um, um, uh, Intermountain in um, Utah, HCA. Uh, SSM in St. Louis, Providence St. Joseph, Trinity, have all come together and said, look, this is crazy on generics, we're going to just make our own. And I think we're going to see more of that where organizations come together collectively, create a product, do something together, where they're buying, where we've had GPOs for a long time. But we're going to get really serious about that because that's the only way we can lower our operating costs. And we have to lower our operating costs. So, I think you're going to see both, Bill, and then you'll see some non-traditional partnerships, and you mentioned a couple of them, you know, PPS, Aetna, you know, uh, uh, a lot of those that are out there in order to kind of put, position yourselves in the market a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, I'm going to reference a healthcare leaders article. Um, you, you said, uh, we're deconstructing the traditional health system. We have built, uh, we've been built around large hospitals. That's an old version of a successful health system, or soon will be. Our new plan makes us more digital, more ambulatory, and there's less emphasis on the hospital as the core. And uh, this goes back to something we talked about earlier, where you know you have health systems that have really pushed out into the community. They've deconstructed uh, their their buildings and really put you know labor and delivery. They put these uh, really facilities all over the city, um, but. I don't, this isn't the end of deconstruction, is it? I mean, digital technologies, the consumer revolution, new paradigms for uh, delivery of care. Um, we're we're going to see much more deconstruction moving forward. Um, how do you see that playing out? Well, I think the only way for us to compete uh, in the market that we're in, how do you compete against a natural, uh, national ambulatory surgery company? Well, if every inventory surgery center you have is part of a hospital in a community somewhere, you're not going to be competitive. So what we've said is that we've got to bring all of those units together. 
or the ambulatory of the vision, 12 7 stage, then allows us to function more as a business in the ambulatory space than an add on to an acute care facility. Now, the same way I'd say the acute care facility needs to tighten up how they work. They've got to get streamlined better, smarter, faster as well. But they need to concentrate on acute care in those facilities. The medical group needs to really function as a medical group across seven states. That's a different type of delivery of care that has a, probably a digital arm to it, but it also has to be much more community-based than before. So really taking apart those then the other thing for Providence St. Joseph is also becoming a services company. We're taking a page out of what Optum did, right? Uh, you know, we got to optimize Providence St. Joseph. So we, in addition to our scale, have to become a services company to other to medical groups, to other hospitals. You know, we're, as you know, we're supplying uh, EMRs to other hospitals that we don't own. And, you know, we're, we're doing that work. I think we're going to have to figure out ways to produce revenue from things other than direct patient care. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, uh, so we're coming to the end of our time, but I wanted to uh, cover one last topic, and that's data with you. And there's, there's a handful of ways I want to talk about this. Um, you've talked about the power of data in healthcare um, and how it can have a meaningful impact on, on outcomes and, and many other things. Uh, we, uh, uh, we really have a ton of data within healthcare already. Uh, so let's talk about ownership of that data, scope of that data, and privacy. So let's start with the first question, which is, um, uh, who, do you, who do you think owns the medical record or who should own the medical record? And how will that change the way we view data and use data uh, moving forward? So I, I think ultimately, uh, individuals need to be in control of their own data. I mean, I think that's almost a given. The question is, who do they get proxy to and who do they trust? And uh, unfortunately, we've had some bad examples out in the social media uh, venue. You know, I think in healthcare, we've always considered the, you know, the sanctity of data and, you know, we're, we're regulated to do that. So we protect that uh, incredibly well. So what I hope is that I want individuals to have uh, control over their data but I hope they will trust their health organization to be that trusted partner with them to then figure out how that data gets used and where it gets used. And I would not be as great as to say, just trust me to some of the other organizations out there that are now trying to accumulate data on folks. I just think that one of the advantages that we have in the sector where we are is that I think our our patients and our families still trust us, and we have a relationship with them already. So that's the way I would see that, uh, see that working. And then the question is, is how do we use that data for our patients' benefit, but also kind of advance how we do care, and in a way that uh, you know, as, as you know, we're we're a five hundred one c three. We're not a publicly traded company. Our interest is the health of our patients and communities. So we see ourselves being able to use that data advance that not necessarily as a shareholder value yeah it's 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 interesting we may need to, to, to develop some new skills and suit some new uh, capabilities so you know the the data question to me always delves into the scope of uh, you know the other data that's out there because we know that the clinical data and the claims data tell a certain side of the story but social determinants tells us so much more um, and, you know, as social, as, as healthcare providers are, should we be, uh, on behalf of our patients, on behalf of the community, starting to talk to them about providing us their, their Facebook data and their Google search data and their Amazon data? Cause we know that when you combine those things, you can have more of an impact on their health outcome, given that. You know, they give us proxy, they trust us, we have clinical and data experts who are looking at it and putting together a whole picture of health. Do you think that's in the future or do you think that's a little too out there at this point? You no, know, I, I think it's critical. You know, we're talking a lot about social determinants of health. We recognize that the biggest determinants are education, housing, food. You know, those things have far more effect on your health than your genome does. So, 
those are critical aspects of how we keep people healthy. I think it's going to be essential. And, you know, at Providence St. Joseph's, he has one of the largest housing divisions in Washington and Oregon. So we've been in housing. We're in education. You know, we have a university in Montana. So we recognize how important those elements are. I think capturing those elements in a very secure way are going to be essential in providing individual the best health for individuals. And we're particularly seeing that as we look at taking care of our Medicaid patients, that the data that's more useful to us is really a lot of the social determinants data more so than that. So I think it's critical, Bill. I see it, I see it coming. I hope that uh, you know, uh, our patients will trust us to be that uh, trusted source that they can share it with. And, uh, uh, so my answer to that is yes, and I think it'll happen sooner than we think, but it's gonna have to happen in a way that people feel secure about it. I think, I think people have been pretty rattled by some of the things they've read about recently, and I think that's unfortunate, and I think it may get in the way of, of how we care for people. And you know, we've experienced some of this around mental health data, that one of the problems that we have in taking care of patients a lot of times are the black box around mental health information, that when someone shows up in the emergency room, they're sometimes unable to get at that. But I think people are always reticent about what data gets out there and not. And uh, you know, we see it strictly from the standpoint of being able to care for people's health and help better in the world they have a little information. That's great. I Hey, Rod, I just want to, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I always enjoy our conversations. Um, what's, it, it's, you, uh, what's the best way for people to follow you? I always ask this question at the end of the show. Uh, do you have a, do you have a blog that you, cause, cause your full-time job isn't enough. Do you, do you, yeah, well, I, you know, I have some of the greatest people that, that, that work for me and, uh, they really, um, uh, are able to kind of get messaging after me. But I think the best way is just Rod Hockman, R-O-D-H-O-C-H-M-A-N, uh, M-D.org. Uh, and that has most of what I'm thinking about on a, on a regular basis out there. So it's, it's fun, and I love hearing from folks and getting their ideas. I mean, I, I would say that the two-way exchange really helps. Uh, I find that from our caregivers and from everyone else. It's great to hear folks come and we're, we're willing to put ourselves out there and, but we're also willing to kind of hear if some people have a different take on it, what, what they're thinking. So that, that'd be great. I'd love to hear from folks. Absolutely. And uh, so you can also, uh, you can follow me at the patient CIO on Twitter, health Eric's website. Uh, you can follow the show at this week in HIT and check out the website at this week in health IT.com. Uh, catch the videos on the U YouTube channel this week in health IT.com slash video. Uh, please come back every Friday for more news information and commentary from industry influencers. That's all for now. Thanks, Rod. Really appreciate it. Great to talk to you. Take care. Bye.